In Jesus' name.
And it is so good to see you in the house of the Lord, whether you're up there in the balcony. We see you all the way up there, all the way to the front row as well. So we are glad that you're here at Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church. Welcome to Westside. If this is your first time here, there are some ways for you to connect that little QR code or there's some little cards in your pew that you can actually fill out just for us to connect together. An opportunity, if you have ever any prayer requests, we would love for you to share those. But as we look around for a moment, would you find somebody next to you? Would you shake their hand? Would you greet them in the name of the Lord? Would you just do that for a moment as they're doing that? Amen. Edna and Janet and Mike, Charlotte, I uh, hope you don't work too hard today. Glad to have One, you here this morning. Two, three. So Patricia, thanks for being here. So our online family, we love y'all. Glad that you're here this morning. Oh 
It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's an amazing thought that a holy God and a perfect God would love sinners like us. And this song right now is just a perfect testament to that, that God really and truly loves us. Holy 
Well, amen, I hope that you had an opportunity to think about the song that you just sang, that God really loves us. I've met some of y'all, and um, I don't know if you agree with this or not, sometimes we may be a little bit on the unlovable side. Anybody ever act unlovable? And that, that God would still know everything about you, that he would be willing to say, you know what, I love everything. I really, truly love you enough to give my life for you. And so as we celebrate that today, um, I invite you to turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I appreciate my boy Eli up here and uh, Ethan up at the top helping us out, and Brother Tim as always. Uh, Eli, I think there's a little, um, uh, a little sermon one that you can click on, and it'll kind of get those, uh, those lights down a little bit and stuff. But as we get started today, recently, in the last couple of years, I've gotten this thing. I used to drive a PT Cruiser for a while, then I had a 300 and stuff, and then I had all these different kind of cars. But recently, guys, I got a pickup truck. I don't know if y'all have seen it or not, uh, but I got this pickup truck, and I've had it a couple of years now, and so when I got this pickup truck, you know, I don't know if you know, but my pickup truck has a camper shell on the back of it, amen, amen. I don't know, you know, some of y'all are like, man, that's so, you know, Tony's like, that's Paul Paulish and stuff, you got one of them Paul Paul cars. I'm like, I really don't care, because I can put all my junk into the back of it, it stays dry. One of these days, we're going to go camping in the back of our, you know, little, like, mini size Frontier and stuff, uh, you know, I got a pickup truck. Now, I had to learn this, though. That all pickup trucks, and how many of you have pickup trucks in here? Let me just get a little grunt, grunt. Rah, rah, rah. I, I see y'all, those of you online, give us a little thumbs up as well. So I see you, but what I realized that the first time I got a pickup truck, because I'd never had one before, and I never had used this thing before, I knew that in my, um, you know, uh, four cylinders, six, eight, whatever it has in there and stuff, you know, I speak truck language, I knew that since I had gotten this brand new truck, new to me at least, that I'd always use these little black nozzles, and so I figured in my Nissan Frontier, what I need to do is, because I'd gotten a pickup truck and I'd never used the black ones, I've always used the black ones, then I saw a bunch of them pickup driver guys would use the green ones. At the, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but they have these green nozzles, and all the pickup truck guys that I've ever known, that's what they would use. And so I'm thinking to myself, hey, if I'm going to get gas... I get the green one, I pick the green one out because all truck drivers have the green one. And so what I began to think to myself, I got a pickup truck. I've always used black for cars. I got a pickup truck, now I use the green one. Amen? Oh, uh, no. So, 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 you know, you take it out and it looks the same. It's just the same kind of thing. You know, it's got a little pump up and all that. But it, the green one, that, it did not fit into my tank. And I tried. But something happened, it just did not work. So I then began to realize after talking to some folks who, uh, who helped me out, you know, they kind of directed me in my first pickup truck. They said, no, brother, that's for diesel. Well, they didn't tell me that whenever I bought the pickup truck, that, you know, the green one was not just for trucks because I'd only seen the truck drivers use that. It was for just diesel, and the black one was for unleaded. And some of y'all even use the unleaded that's on the third one to the right. I mean, you know, the real one, like the, the 90-something proof and stuff. So I don't, you know, the, you, know you got the, the real ones. But, but the green one wouldn't fit. Now, now some of y'all don't take my man card away. But if the green one would have fit, I would have put the green one into the wrong tank. What would have happened? It ain't going to run very well, very long, and in the end of that thing, there may be a little sputtering, there may be a little bit of a stopping, there may be a couple of things that would happen to where all of a sudden this pickup truck that I just got drove all the way down to Gulf Shores, Alabama to get it, this pickup truck, all of a sudden, if I would have used the wrong one in there, I would not have made it home. I might have spent more than I did on that pickup truck. Why? Because you cannot put diesel into an unleaded. You can't put unleaded into a diesel. And Anybody understand that? So if you try to fill the tank with the wrong stuff and trying to do so, filling the tank will only cause issues, problems, cause trauma to this vehicle because it is not meant to run off of that kind. Now listen, any of you who are married or dating someone today, guys, can I ask you a quick question? Guys, have, 
Have you ever noticed that your spouse seems to be sputtering and not quite running like when you first found them? Ladies, have you ever found that guy? And all of a sudden, when it used to be, you know, in an expanded tire, now it's kind of flat and droopy. Uh, if, you know, all of a sudden it had like a little, 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 little roll like here and there and stuff. And, and all of a sudden you thought to yourself, you know what, I got, a, I got an eight cylinder. I got, you know, he a man's man. But, but boy, now he's like a, an electric model and stuff. And you're just like, you know, four cylinder here and there. Just hadn't lived up to what you thought. The warranty has run out. Anybody know what I'm not? You know, so, so we begin to look at this. And could it be the reason why they're sputtering, the reason why they're not flowing as smoothly as they should, the reason why is because you have been trying to fill their tank with the wrong stuff. Boy, if I get on to him real good, if I just kind of nag him enough, that will get him moving in the right direction. Mm, really? Has that worked for you so far? Boy, if I just, you know, if I, if I uh, just, just, you know, if I fold my hands and I puff up my little bottom lip and I make it go over my nose and stuff, if I just show her, you know, how disappointed and upset I am, then that is how I'm going to solve this issue. I'll fix her. I'll fix him. I'll get this right. And the problem is that oftentimes we try to fill our relationships with things that will not ever allow that other person to run smoothly, to move forward. They will begin to sputter and die on the vine. Why? Because they have been filled with the wrong things. We've been going over this marriage uh, sermon series of, of sinking ship. Because sometimes our, our love boat, and we're getting ready, anybody excited to go next, next Sunday? Listen, that's our last Sunday here in America, and so all of a sudden after that, Monday, we're going down to Mexico and stuff, and so I've been practicing my, you know, oh, I bless my old, yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so I've been getting that ready and stuff. But listen, sometimes our love boat has turned into a battleship, and we've had friendships and companionships and relationships that have been just sinking around us. And so, so I, I truly wanted us that by the end of February, and I've told you this, by the end of February, if you are here married, dating, engaged, you're here and you're looking at your life and you're saying, well, you know what, man, I feel a lot of my life is sinking, then listen, I hope that by the end of this month, you'll be able to, as a couple, Find an altar at your house, in your bedroom, or here at church and say, you know what, we are renewing this relationship that we have to one another. And so if you turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Last week we talked about the key, the essential of a marriage is that it might be a marriage that is focused on Christ. Christ-centered. Christ is at the very pinnacle of your relationship. Everything in your life is geared towards Christ. That's what we talked about last week. So last week was about being focused on Christ. This week it's about being fueled by love. 1 Corinthians 13. Now we do have a seminary student in here. And the seminary student, Brother Drake, will tell you, well, you know, Brother Marcus, um, it might be called the love chapter, but you have to read uh, chapters in the Bible according to the context in which they're in. And so that's not like a marriage chapter, really, Brother Marcus. That's my Brother Drake you know, voice right there. It's spot on. I know what it would be. Um, so, so let me give you a kind of context to this. Chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians is all about worship and the Lord's Supper. It's how do we properly respond to the Lord. Chapter 12, it gets in this discussion about spiritual gifts and, and we're one body but many parts. And then chapter 14, it picks up that spiritual gifts thing again about prophecy and speaking in tongues. But chapter 13 is stuck right in the middle because he's given this illustration to these Corinthians that says, look... You have these uh, amazing gifts, and you're really focused on that. You're focused on this feeling that you get out of worship. And then he says, you know what? And then you have all these people, and you're not really doing worship the right way. And so he looks at them this way. But then in chapter 13, he says, look, this is the key. This is the key to your life. This is the key to everything, this idea of being fueled by love. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when you find that in your Bible, would you stand with me in honor of the Lord and his word? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is oftentimes referred to as the love chapter. Some of you, on your wedding day, you may have had someone read this, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Some of you may not even remember. That may have been the verse that was read during your wedding. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Anybody? Love. That's the very first thing. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, Miss Annalise and Caleb have been leading our little children in that, so they've been learning this whole idea of the fruit of the Spirit. But it starts with 
love. We are nothing without love. The Bible says that God is love. And so look in your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4. I'll begin in the New King James Version. You follow along the version that you have before you. Love suffers long, and it is kind. Love does not, delight, does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Verse 5. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, it thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never fails. And then the last verse that I want you to look at is the last verse in that chapter. Go ahead and put that up there for me if you don't mind. Let's read this together. Look at what it says there, that last one right after this one. Uh, Mr. Ethan, if you don't mind, put that up there. It says these words, these three things remain, all right? The things that remain is hope, love, joy. Keep on going to the next one after that. You got it. Find me. You with me? It's coming right there. These three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. You might remember what the greatest of these things is? Love. But the greatest of these is love. Father, thank you for this morning. An opportunity just to come and worship you. We pray, Father, as we go into your word now, that you might just allow your word to change our life. Father, I know that in this, this room online, that there are folks here who are right at the verge of giving up hope for their relationship. They're single and they've given up all hope that God could ever provide a godly man or a godly woman. They've been dating for a while and they're not sure where this is going to lead. All of that stuff together, Father, means that we just need to hear from you. And so, Lord, Lord who loves us, Lord who cares about us this morning, would you be glorified even in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. As you're seated, let's see who we're working with. What's love? Ooh. What the world needs. Okay. When a man. Okay. Because sometimes I just, I want to know what. Wow. I just call. To, okay, that's my Stevie Wonder. I can't help fall. Wow. Now, all of that, and some of y'all, some of y'all could remember every single word of that. Some of those songs, y'all could remember every single word of that. Some of y'all will not hear another word from this sermon because in your mind, you're going to be replaying every single word of that. And yet, some of y'all will try to tell me this morning, after you can remember every Elvis song, Every uh, Shania Twain song, you know, or, or, or what's that girl who's saying, you know, I drove my key into your car, kind of, you know, whatever that is, Brother Wayne. And so, so y'all can remember every one of those song lyrics. Back in the day, you can do like speed rap in a moment, but, but some of y'all have forgotten what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, and you've never really memorized it into your life. If there is a song, if there is something that you want to memorize, if there is a list of things that you ought to be able to put into your mind. See, some of you grew up in an environment where when I say the word love and I begin to talk about this whole idea of love, some of you have no idea or clue what love really is. And some of you have been asking since you've been a child, I really do want to know what love is and I want you to show me because you grew up in a dysfunctional love environment. You grew up never experiencing love. You never experienced God kind of love. And so begin to have relationships where you fall short of what love truly means. And so for a moment, we would have looked at Marriage goal one is to be focused on Christ, but marriage goal two is to make sure that you are being fueled by love. And so what is love? Now, the original language, if you missed out this morning in our, our Bible study class, and so we've been going over that. Hopefully, you know, if you uh, get on your Bible app and you'll find your uh, west side, you can make it your church, and then there's a link to week two on there of the marriage talks. I hope that you'll take an opportunity, you as a couple. Um, I actually know if you started that or not, and so, you know, it sends me an email to say, so-and-so started the marriage talk. And I look around, y'all, some of y'all ain't started the marriage talk yet, okay? That's fine, you know, read your Bible when you can. But the truth of it is, it talks about this idea of love. So what is love? And hopefully you got a little bulletin this morning. There is one word for love, 
It is really the definition that most people today, when they begin to look at their songs that they sing, when it gives them to be what they're talking about, they use this word love. You know, we say, I love my dog, I love my car, I love my mama and them, I love the way that when I get out of here, we get in there before the Pentecostals to eat lunch. I love those kind of things, right? But, but here's the thing. The original language is different. It uses the one word is this word eros, which means um, brown chicken, brown cow. Okay, that's what it means. All right, that's that's what the word eros. Think about the root word of that eros, erotic. All right, so that's one word that it uses. Some people think that's the only way that I can show love, express love, receive love is I've given myself to whoever I can, and that's what love is really all about. That's one word for love. It is eros. Bible uses another word for for love. It is the word phileo, which is this idea of phila, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and so that's another word for love. That is this friendship kind of love. You know the Sometimes the, one of the worst things that can happen in a, a love relationship, a romantic between a husband and wife, is that they just know each other as, as just friends. There's no more, no more intimacy coming together as husband and wife. They're just kind of, you know, passing strangers in the night and stuff. And so, so there's this idea of just phileo, meaning, I, I mean, I'm married to my best friend. Hopefully you're married to your best friend as well. And so, so you know, we get this idea of, of warm friendship, affection. There's another word for storge, which means this idea of a, a family relationship between a, a dad and his daughter, between a mom and her son. It's this relationship between families. But then there's this word here, the word that is the word that is used when it says love is whatever, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. The word there is actually the word agape. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. Agape does not envy. Agape does not boast. You say, what, what are we talking about? That, why is that any different? Agape is the same word when the Bible says, for God so loved the world, for God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so when the Bible says this word, even if you remember from last week, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, it is this word agape. Agape means sacrificial, unconditional, Without expecting that person to respond to you, you just simply love and give and sacrifice just as Christ loved the church. That is that word, agape. And so, so listen, when the Bible here says, when you love, this is what love looks like. This is what love responds like. This is how love is. And so that Bible says, love, agape, is these things. Now, I'm going to do a quick test. All right? If you're here with your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever, look at them real quick. Daughter, don't look too long. Okay. Uh, you know, all right, don't look at them too much. All right, that that kind of makes me a little, uh, but, um, but it's good. In, in, the, in the Bible, there are like some love languages. Some of you dads are like, that's right. He, you know, she might be married to him, but I don't, you know, all those kind of things. But in the Bible, we see these words for agape and eros and stuff. But there's a guy who wrote a book called The Five Love Languages, Gary Chapman. You may want to check that out. When Gary Chapman wrote these, uh, the love languages, and I think, well, there you go. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, he, he said, look, these are five different ways that you respond, that your love tank is filled. One way could be words of affirmation. You just like folks to say something nice about you. You, you gravitate towards whenever they say something and you, or your mind hears that word. Boy, they love me, respect me, care about me. Another one is acts of service. You come home and the dishwasher is empty and stuff because why? Because they served you in some way. That means the most to you. Another thing is giving gifts. You know, you may just be somebody who loves the, not, not expensive, but just, just gifts that are like, you know, heartfelt, touching, meaningful gifts. Another one is quality time. You just like un, 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 uninterrupted, just quality time. And then the other one is physical touch. Physical touch is not just the brown chicken, brown cow. It is just, you know, loving on someone, just hugging them, just caring about that person. I say all that to look at this. Your job, husband, your job, wife, dating couple, is that that person is going to respond to one of these different kind of love languages. So your, your adventure in life is to figure out what makes them tick, how does that respond, what happens here. I say all that to say this. We would need to take a moment to take a test about your love. I was a senior in high school. I was senior class vice president. Best dressed of that time. So when I went there, I went on a date. What happened? Yeah, it's like, what happened? I went on this date, and I got me a Chrysler convertible for prom. Ooh. 
It was maroon, had a gray top. You could even put it down and put it back up and put it down and put it back up. I got it from Enterprise. Well, I didn't because I was too young, but Mama just went ahead and got it for me, and then I got that for my senior prom. Hey, her name was Kim. She was another Kim Sylvia, not the one that broke my heart and cheated on me. Another one. What y'all have? That's wrong, okay. But I went to this prom with, with Kim, and I tell you, I thought I was in love. I rented a tux. It had tails back in the day. I got me a Chrysler. Isn't that a song? I got me a Chrysler. It's all right, big as a whale, and it's about to set sail. Um, some of y'all are way too young for that. But I got me this Chrysler convertible. It kind of went up and down and up and down. And so I thought, you know what? This is, this is the one. Oh, this is the one. But she thought we were just going as friends. <laughs> and I had, I had rented a, a convertible, and I got a tux. And, and all of a sudden, we go to prom, and you know how guys do. You know, just kind of stay in your lane. Right here, just kind of stay in your lane. And at the end of it, I looked. I couldn't find Kim anywhere. Where'd Kim go? Kim, I'm in a convertible. It's parked outside. I've got the keys right here. It says Enterprise on the little tag and stuff. It's, it's right there. Well, Kim decided that we were just friends and that she had a say you just a friend on the side. And, and so Kim left with him and, and I was in my tux and walking outside into my Chrysler. It didn't have push start back then. And I sit down, I drop the top, and I ride off into the sunset by myself. <laughs> I wave at folks as they look at me, a guy in a tux and a Sebring, you know, whatever that was. And he's just riding by himself in his tux, and there's no person next to him. I thought that's what love was. I have learned that's not what love ever is. So what is love? If we took a test this morning and said, this is what love is. When I tell that person, husbands, when, I, when you tell your spouse, I love you. Wives, when you tell your spouse, I love you. When you tell your child, I love you. When you look at a brother and be like, man, I love you, bro. What is that? What are we talking about here? Well, here's the test. It starts in verse 4. These questions, some are taken from Revive Our Hearts. The verse 4, the first thing says, love suffers long. Now, your translation may put it this way. Love is patient. It is patient. It has a long fuse is what the original language means. It, it is something that is, is patient. It waits. It is willing to be patient. And I look around you. Statistics say that 98% of you probably had an argument this morning because one person's always early and the other person is always late. Amen or oh me? Oh, oh. Ooh, he, he answered that quicker. He was not very patient in that answer. But the reality of God's word says, look, that love is patient. So let me ask you, are you patient when people inconvenience you or irritate you? Are you patient then when you leave the parking lot? When somebody gets in your seat, when something happens, will you be patient? Do not say that I love this person. Ooh, baby, I love you with all my heart. I die for you. And you're not even going to be patient with them? The Bible says, look, love is patient. It also says that love is kind. Love is thoughtful. It cares for more for others than for self. Can I ask you today... Are you using your tongue, your words, are you using them in your house to encourage and build up? If I were to go to your home and I were to just be a little fly on the wall and all of a sudden I came in on the back porch door and I flew in there and I put myself on the little part of your, your cabinet door right next to the little place where you hide all the, the stuff that you just kind of throw in your, your junk drawer, if I hid there for a moment, would I be amazed at the kindness that your family is known for and the words and the actions and the ways that you treat one another? Or would I see, like I've seen sometimes, it seems like the older that we get, the grumpier we are. And I can say that as an old person myself. You can't say that yet. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever met old grumpy people? Well, well listen, that is not an excuse 
for what the Bible says love is. It says love is patient, love is kind. Here's the next question. Love does not envy. It is not jealous. It doesn't want what it doesn't have. And so it doesn't envy someone else's spouse, someone else's life. Uh, love is, it does not envy. Are, are you, let me ask you a question. Are, are you genuinely glad when someone else is promoted or gets a raise, when they're recognized, and then you are overlooked? Can you handle times that people don't give you all the props that you deserve? Can you handle those moments in life that it just seems as though that, you know what, something else good has happened to somebody else, but I am envious at that moment? Love does not parade itself. It's not boastful. Uh, are you content to do good works without recognition or praise? Can, can you handle not getting somebody to just kind of stroke your back and say, good job, I'm so proud of you? Ladies, can I ask you a question? Have you ever had a husband, a boyfriend, they come home, and that one time that they actually put their clothes into the hamper, that one time that they actually load the dishwasher, that one time that they actually changed the baby's clothes who's now, you know, 27 years old, that one time that they did that, and they come in and they just expect, husband, you are the greatest man ever, you put your clothes away, Woo! Husband, I have put these dishes away 12,000 times, but that one time, now I'm supposed to give you applause and appreciation and all those kind of things. Listen, so the Bible says love does not envy and it does not parade itself. It does not parade itself. Love does not parade itself. So, you know, are you content to just do good works without receiving praise? That's what love does. Love does not parade itself. Here's another one. Uh, love, as we begin to look at love, is not puffed up. It's not proud. It's not arrogant. It, it, it doesn't have a swelled head. I mean, look at the person on your row. Some of them have swelled heads, right? Just big old noggins on their, on their, their neck and all. But, but the idea is, do, do you harbor a spirit of pride? If you want to ruin a relationship in your spouse and between you and them, harbor a spirit of pride where all of a sudden that gets in the way. Verse 5 says, love does not behave rudely. Are you courteous to others uh, in your house? It does not seek its own is what it says as well. It, it does not demand its own way. It's not always me first. And so as we begin to look at this whole idea of love not seeking its own, we have to realize that, you know, that, that it's not always about being me first in this relationship. You consciously look out for the welfare of others above yourself. Love is not provoked. Um, you can see that. Love is not provoked. It is not easily angered as some of your definitions may say in your Bible. It's not easily angered. It doesn't fly off the handle. Uh, do you have the kind of love that overlooks offenses? Love thinks no evil, is what the Bible says. It thinks no evil, keeps no record of wrongs. Some of you don't just get hysterical, you get historical. You ever met folks like that? My mom would always get hysterical. She'd literally throw stuff at my dad, you know, kitchen plates, whatever. And I, I'd walk in and I'd like, bam. And, you know, she got a little hysterical. I'm going to edit that out because if she's watching, I'm about to get in trouble. Um, she would get historical, hysterical, but, but some folks, even worse, get historical. They have a long record of all the wrongs that you've done. You get into an argument about whatever's happening right now, and you can't even fairly fight because you're bringing up everything else that happened a week, a year, 10 years ago, and so all of a sudden you're getting historical while actually getting hysterical at the same time. The Bible says, look, love, real love, does not rejoice uh, in, in iniquity. It is not uh, easily provoked. Love doesn't seek its own. Um, love keeps no record of of wrongs. The Bible also says, as we look at this whole idea, it says that in verse 5 and verse 6, it's not provoked, it thinks no evil. Verse 6 says it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7 says love bears all things, which means it never gives up. It also says it believes all things, which it means it thinks correctly, it hopes all things, which means that, you know what, it believes that God could change things, it endures all things, which means it just sticks through. Love never fails. Now, I say all of that to say this. If love is patient and love is kind and love does not envy and it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not easily angered, love keeps no record of wrongs, it always trusts, always believes, always hopes, bears all things. If that is what the Bible says that love is, and you gave yourself a test, all right? Let's give yourself a test for a minute. Could you fill in your name with blank is? Blank suffers long, 
Blank is kind. Blank does not envy. Blank does not parade itself. If we were to put your name in there, all right, as a husband, is that truly what is true of you today? That you could say in your life, this is who I am. This is the kind of man that I am. This is the character. I love my wife, and this is how I show it practically, tangibly, by doing these things. Wives, you say you love your husband. Is that true of you? That you know what? That you keep no record of wrongs. You're not easily angered. You are hoping and believing all these things that there we go in through life. We wonder sometimes why in the world, why in the world does it seem as though we are so, so sputtering in our relationships? It seems as though we are so so hurting one another. It seems as though we can't ever get past this moment. And it may be because what you are trying to fill that tank with is not what the Bible says is a relationship that is fueled by love. Husbands, the Bible says love your wife. That's what love is. It is not how your parents treated one another. It is not what the world says that love is. Love is agape, unconditional, sacrificial love. And that, if you're wondering why does she act this way, could it be that you are not filling her what God has said that this is what love truly is? Everything in life begins and ends with love. My relationship to God, he says the greatest relationship that you could ever have is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. My relationship to other people, it is to love your neighbor as yourself. My relationship with serving the Lord, 1 Corinthians begins by saying, look, if you can do all these things, you can find healing and you can do these acts of service and you don't have love, you're like a clanging cymbal, just a gong that has happened that's here today and gone tomorrow. Love is essential to all those things and it even means love for your spouse. You ever heard somebody say this as we kind of move to the end of this? You ever heard somebody say, love is blind? You ever heard somebody say that? I wonder if you believe that. Love is blind. Now, if I look at some of y'all's relationship and look at mine, the, the, the Kims in my life, um, no, no offense, you know, and so, um, you know, I, there are some great Kims in my life, but the ones that I dated was not good. And so, um, and Brother, Brother Lively, don't say amen to that and stuff. You know, you, 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 know, you give that to yourself. But in life, I guarantee you, if I would have done as the advice that somebody gave me one time to say, hey, keep both eyes wide open before you get married and half shut afterwards, then I would have realized that some of the relationships that I had been in were not the best kind of relationships that I need to have. Listen, if y'all can look back at your life and say, this was true of them, and this was true of her, and this really happened to him, and this is what they were like. If you would have opened up your eyes in that courting stage, dating stage, and if you would have been honest with yourself, kept both eyes wide open, you would have realized, you know what, marriage ain't going to fix this. Uh, all of a sudden, if, you know, we get married, and you know what, man, he's got a temper problem now, but I guarantee you when we get married, I'll fix him, I'll change him, boo-boo. That's not how this thing works. But the reality is, you keep both eyes wide open, how they treat their parents, how they live their life, how they handle money, how they handle problems, how they do all that stuff. You keep both eyes wide open before you get married to say, you know what, if I'm going to tell that person that I love them and sacrificially give my life for that person, I need to make sure that I have both eyes wide open. And then once you get married, you're stuck with them, then you might as well keep them half shut. You knew what you was getting into before you ever got married. And so you know what? That toilet paper roll, their clothes, their messiness, their disorganization, you knew all that. The fact that they couldn't drive, you knew all that before you got married and stuff. You know, the, the, the mirrors and everything else, you knew that. So just keep them half shut afterward, all right? Both eyes wide open beforehand, half shut afterwards, and then just begin to realize that if I use 1 Corinthians 13 as a checklist about their life, and if they say they love me, but they just want something from me. They say they love me and care about me, but that doesn't measure up to what God says. Love is patient. They're impatient. Love is kind. They're rude and hateful to me sometimes. It is not easily angered. Boy, they, get, they have a tight, tight fuse on them. Boy, they keep a record of wrongs. Listen, that's, that's not love. That's not, what a, that's not manipulation. It's not love. So they're going to look at these things. If that is what you're settling for, then you're settling for less of what God has for you. We fall short if we insert our name into all of those loves. But can I tell you what the Bible says? The Bible says that God is love. You know whose name does not ever fall short if you were to include their name? Put Jesus into that whole 1 Corinthians 13. If God is love, 
And I say, well, I, I'm not as loving as I should be. In fact, reading this this past week, there are times that I knew, okay, I fall short on that one. Uh, I, I am, I, you know, there's times that I'm not there. I'm not here yet in my relationship to the Lord and my spouse and, and other people that I care and say that I love them. I'm not there yet. But here's the good news. You can put Jesus in front of all of those words and descriptions and it will fit. You say, what are you talking about? Jesus suffers long. You ought to be glad that God is patient with you. You ought to be glad that the very love of God is willing to suffer long, waiting on you for you to finally get your life to the Lord and place it in his hands. I don't know how long God has to wait on some of you because he's been suffering a long time for you to finally say, God, I'm going to give all of my life to you, my family, my relationships, my wife, my children, my spouse. I'm finally going to get to that place where I give it all to Jesus and he's just been suffering long for you. He is kind. The Lord does not envy. The, he does not parade himself. He is not puffed up. He does not behave rudely. He does not seek his own. In fact, he's willing to sacrificially give all of himself. He's not easily angered and he thinks no evil. He does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things, believes all things. Jesus hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. Jesus never fails. He never fails. And I'm just going to chew on that before we head out of here this morning. You see, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, The only reason why I love is because he first loved me. Now, some of you grew up in such a dysfunctional, messed up way of looking at love. Your parents never understood how to love you. Your, your spouse never understood how to love you. You can't even love yourself. And so your lens that you look through life is always a, a dysfunctional way of seeing, I think this is what love is. I'm not sure if this is love. I don't know if I can give love, receive love. I don't know what my love Love languages, I just feel as though, you know what, I'm not really certain about this whole thing called love. Listen, the Bible says that God is love, that Jesus himself loves you in this way, and it says that Jesus shall never, ever fail you. So what are we talking about here? In those times that you look at relationships that have fallen apart, you look at your own life that has fallen apart, in the middle of all that stuff that fails you left and right, your husband will never be the kind of man that you think he ought to be. He is a human. He is a sinner. He is in need of Jesus. And the reality is what you're expecting him to fulfill in your heart and to fill you up and to just make you satisfied, that is the role that only Jesus Christ can give you. You're thinking to yourself, well, this woman, if she would finally act right, if she would finally get her stuff together, that that woman would finally do these things, then I would be happy, I'd be content, I'd have my life together, and I would no longer feel this failure in my relationships with her and with him and all that stuff happening. Listen, all those things that you're expecting someone else to satisfy you, fulfill you, to love you, and to just fill your tank up, that is a blessing when God gives them to you, but if you don't find it in anyone else, you need to realize, I can only find that in Jesus Christ. If you're not happy with Jesus, you won't ever be happy with some man, woman, past, child thing in your life. You need the only one that shall never, ever fail you, which is Jesus. He never fails. So some folks will look, well, preacher, let's face it. You and Kim, one, couldn't stick together. You and Kim, number two, couldn't stick together. And there's been other Kims along the way that said, you know, like little Kim, they just kind of just walked on out. All right, fine. But I'm not talking about me. I'm not talking about my failures. I'm trying to take you and point you to Jesus. He's the only one who never fails. And listen, today, if you feel like in your relationship between husband and wife, you have gone through a lot of failures. How do you fill that tank? You fill it with love. First of all, God's love into your life. And then through God loving you, you're able to love them. And you do it patiently, kindly, generously, without uh, seeking your own. You do it as God says. And I'm going to believe that God can change my marriage. I'm going to bear this up. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to hope in all things. And I'm just going to know that God can get me through this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's known as the love chapter. Can I ask you for a moment, what chapter in life are you in right now? Is it not labeled the love chapter? In fact, it's like that little microphone just did. It's, it's the disruption chapter. It's the turmoil chapter. 
It's the things not clicking right chapter. It's the times in life where it's just you're at battling chapter. What is the chapter that you're in? Here's the good news. I can't get you out of this chapter you're in. But if today you say, Lord, turn the page. Lord, for our relationship, turn the page. Some of you have just recently given your life to Christ. You're saying, God, you turn the page from my past into my beginning, my new beginning. And then you know what you do? You give your pen that has written down every chapter of your life and you give it to the Lord. Back in the day, I used to write these love letters. This was before texting, Twitter, swiping right or left, Brother Drake. You used to have to write stuff down on a sheet of paper. Not even papyrus. They had paper back then. And what you would do, Brother Drake, and I know that you never had to do this with Sister Eva because she was smitten with you from the first time she saw you at Pine and all. And so. But you used to do this. Will you love me? Will you be my girlfriend? Will you stay with me? For the rest of my life. And you draw a little square. And it would be yes. And then you put another square. No. And then for us hopeful folks, you put one more square on there. <laughs> just in case. And it would say what? Maybe. 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 There's hope in maybe. And so you'd write it down. And then at the bottom. XO. XXXXO. O, O, X. And that meant, what does it mean? Hugs and kisses. God has written you a love letter. And in many places in your Bible, it's written in red. It's to say, I love you enough to give my life for you. I love you enough to turn every page, and I love you enough to write that if you would just repent Give your life to Christ. By faith, trust in Him. And you and Him can have that love relationship that will be focused on Christ, geared towards others where you'll be able to say, Lord, I want to be fueled by love. And in the middle of it all, let Him write the pages of your life. Would you bow for just a moment? As our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed for just a second. Those of you who will be baptized this morning, I invite you and encourage you to go and be dismissed at this time. Make your way to the top. So my prayer for this whole last couple of weeks is that you and the person sitting next to you would be willing to say, God, we, we recommit ourselves to having Christ in the center of our life, having Christ in the center of our relationship and our marriage, and that today that we might have a, a relationship that is fueled by love that comes from God alone. And so, Father, I pray today that for those here, those online, those who are just contemplating the idea that maybe it's time to split up, maybe it's time this isn't working, maybe it's time to just, just end it all, that they might believe all things, hope all things, bear all things, and know that love never fails. That, God, they would give you another chance, their relationships another chance, and that they would just cling to you and cling to one another, that you might renew the vows that they make today to just say, God, it's all about you. And so, Father, I thank you today that you are a God of new beginnings, of new starts. You're a God who's able to take the mess of our relationship and turn it into a message of Christ's redemption power. And so, Lord God, today we surrender this to you. We pray your blessing upon this time of invitation. Father God, we pray today that you might move in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us today? If you need to give your life to Christ, we'll be at the front. We invite you to come and, and respond to him. If you as a couple need to just do some business at the altar, would you do that as well? We're going to sing this song that says, come just as you are. Would you come to Christ today? Sorrow that 
heaven came Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal What we're here for? So lay down your burdens Lay down your chains For who are broken Lift up your face So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come back as you are. There's hope for the hopeless and all who have strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste of the grace. There's a rest for the weary. Rested indoors, earth has no sorrow that heaven came to. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. No one is looking around. I'm going to ask just real fast. If you could just bow your head while no one else is looking around. This is between your pastor and you. I'd like to ask a question real quick as we think about relationships and love and what Christ wants to do. If you're willing to say today, and you can just do it right where you are. If you're willing to say today, and I see you in the balcony as well. Pastor, pray for my relationships. Pray for the relationships that I have, that I hope to have that I'm looking for the one that I'm in right now pray for God's healing and hope would you just raise your hand where you are and I see that thank you for that thank you for that thank you for that we have to be fueled by love it is only the love of Christ that will bring healing so in the weeks ahead I saw your hands I'm praying for the Lord to move Hope has, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Would you join me as we just sing that chorus one more time? Say, Lord, we just come and we lay down our burdens before Christ. Sing it with us today. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your So lay down your
be seated for just a moment as we celebrate this moment of baptism today, giving thanks for what the Lord has done and is doing, and so as we gather together to celebrate that for just a moment. Church, good morning. I have my buddy TJ here. Uh, TJ is the, you know, the drum major of the big bad lumberjack band, and as of Wednesday... He is now the child of God, and he gave his life to Christ this, this past Wednesday at church. He came up to me, he said, Drake, I'm going through some things, how do I, how, how do I get through it? I said, you can't get through it unless you got God on your side. And he, he gave his life to Christ, and he said, what is baptism? I, I want to get that done. I said, well, we can do it this Sunday, we can do it next Sunday, we can do whatever you want to. And I explained it to him, he's like, we got to get this done. I want everyone to know that I give my life to Christ. So TJ, I want to ask you, are you saved, and is it God's will for your life to be baptized? So then I'll baptize you. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, amen. As we celebrate that today, um, I, I will not try to do what TJ does on the field. I don't know if you ever saw him, but he does this thing on his, I'll just break it before I ever, ever try. Look, we are excited that, um, that in his life and the life of our young people, we have baptism next Sunday as well. And so if you're thinking to yourself, hey, you know what, I need to make that important decision and make that public before Christ, we invite you to do that as we celebrate that next week as well. I'm going to ask my dear friend to stand up for just a moment. Uh, Miss Lisa Schilling, would you mind stand, standing here before us? After 33 years of being a wanderer, she's finally come back home. Um, amen. And so... Uh, she has faithfully served in the churches that she's been and, you know, just uh, leaving Homa just recently, a place that she has been calling home for a number of years. And today she says, you know what, she's coming back home. Many of you did not have the opportunity, as I did, to know her mom and daddy. And so that were some precious couples. I have some of his ties and tie pins in my house. Uh, I'm going to wear one next week and stuff. And so um, we're just excited the lady, Lisa, has come to say she's a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and she'd like to become a member of Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, so she comes to place herself before the church family to say that she'd like to do so. As all good Baptist churches that she's been a part of and that she is now, we need to do this officially in the form of a vote. And so would anybody like to make a recommendation that we accept it? We have one. We have a second in the back as well. All in favor, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Any opposed? No one? No one? No, no, see, she's my sister, so I can do that and stuff. But we are thankful, sis, for you being uh, back home with us and, and not just a part-timer but a full-timer, and so we're thankful for what the Lord is going to do. I want you to just kind of um, you know, know that some of those announcements that are in there, uh, just take advantage of those things. Hopefully you've received one. Um, she's seated now because she's getting old like myself, um, but she'll get back up because you'll want to extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to her. Your family now back home, and so, you know, too late now, we good. And so, um, no. No, but I'm just thankful for her, but I hope that you'd extend to her the right hand of Christian fellowship before you leave. As we close together today, Brother Reuben Watts, I believe he is our deacon of the day today, and so um, he is not only deacon of the day, but he'll be our cruise director next week, and so we're looking forward to that. Um, all videos, and I just want to give this preemptive warning, all videos that happen on the ship shall stay on the ship, and they... Uh, we are not posting stuff live later on, and so don't get your pastor fired. Um, and so, uh, so we're looking forward to that. Brother Ruben, could you close us today? Everybody our heads, please, and let's look to Jesus who is the author and finish of our faith. Gracious Father God, we just come. Father God, thank you for this day, oh Father God. Thank you for the message the pastor gave to us, oh Father God. Help us to love one another more and more each day, oh Father God. If we don't know about love, Lord, let us seek your face and ask you for guidance, oh, Heavenly Father. We just thank you for all that you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do, dear Lord. And I don't know why this might go in and out on me every time I try to pray. But, Lord, I just want to thank you for everything you've done. And just be with everybody, oh, Lord, as we depart from each other, oh, Father God. And help us to just, like I said, continuously show love to one to, one to another, oh, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.